Napa Valley is a delightful landscape of wildflowers and grapevines spread across miles of rolling hills. It has been immortalized in film, literature, and in the world of wine competitions. As the first and only agricultural preserve in the United States, and the first officially designated viticultural area. This small area of Northern California includes some of the most famous wineries and restaurants in the country. Napa Valley is America's most celebrated wine region. It was officially recognized for its high quality wines when it became California's first American viticultural area in 1981. But it was five years earlier that the region gained international fame for beating out French wines in blind tastings in both red and white categories during the 1976 Judgment of Paris. Currently, about 9% of Napa County is under vine. The region is home to 475 wineries, and 95% of them are families. Producers tend to focus on Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay wines, which are varietals of grapes used to make wine. They continue to create many of the highest quality and most collectible wines in America. But Napa also has a long history of being a hotbed for wine and viticulture experimentation, as there are a ton of newer wines being explored today. But let's take a step back, back into the prehistory of the Napa Valley. In prehistoric times, the valley was inhabited by the Potuan Native Americans, as well as the Wapo tribe in the northwestern foothills. Most villages are thought to have been constructed near the flood plains of watercourses that drain the valley. The maximum prehistoric population is thought to be around 5,000 people. In 1776, a fort was erected by the Spanish governor a short distance northwest of Napa on an elevated plateau. Russians from Sonoma County's Fort Ross grazed the cattle and sheep in the Napa Valley in the early 19th century. And in 1841, a survey party from the fort placed a plaque on the summit of Mount St. Helena. While history shows vines were planted in 1683, it is not likely that those first vineyards were developed as the areas they were planted in were abandoned. In 1779, a group of missionaries led by Father Junipero Serra planted vineyards for use in all of the missions he founded, the Spanish missions. Those early vines were cultivated to produce wine used for religious purposes. The initial plantings were not specific grape varieties. They were field blends, which, due to their use by the church, as mission grapes. The name came from the fact that they were planted
planted by early missionaries. But the commercial birth of the wine industry took hold not much later in the mid to late 1800s, thanks to a small group of European immigrants. Napa and Sonoma, a nearby area, got their start actually when Abraham Lincoln was president. In fact, President Lincoln was the first president to purchase and serve California wine. Before Napa Valley was known for producing quality wine, many of the most popular American wines came from New York, Virginia, Ohio, and Missouri. In fact, vineyards were sprouting all over the place in Southern California before Napa and much of Northern California were cultivated. In nearby Sonoma, as early as 1821, Russian colonists who had primarily come east to hunt seal planted and cultivated grapevines at Fort Ross on the Pacific coast. In nearby Sonoma, as early as 1821, Russian colonists, who had primarily come east to hunt seals, planted and cultivated grapevines at Fort Ross on the Pacific coast. But in 1832, the foundation for the region's wine industry was laid when Padre José Altimera, a Spanish Franciscan monk, planted several thousand grapevines at the at his order's northernmost mission, which was called San Francisco Solano in Sonoma. The clippings from this vineyard were spread throughout the region, and one of the vineyards grew to a very large size, which started to spur the culture of wine already developing in the region. It is known that European grape varieties were being planted in Los Angeles and Anaheim in the 1830s. Jean-Louis Vignet opened the first commercial winery in California in 1833. Jean-Louis was quickly followed by William Wolfskill in Southern California, who owned more than 145 acres of vineyards in Los Angeles in Southern California by the late 1830s. So now let's explore the late 1800s. Napa County was formed and became one of the original California counties when the state became part of the United States in 1850. At that time, Napa was very famous for its wheat. And really the early history of Napa began with George C. Yunt. The land George C. Yunt first began cultivating was given to him as a grant from the Mexican government, as California was not yet awarded statehood and was still part of Mexico. George Calvert Yunt began planting vineyards as far back as 1836 in North California. It is worth noting that the famous nearby town of Youngsville carries his name. The county's population began to grow in the mid-century as pioneers, prospectors, and entrepreneurs moved in and set up residence. During this period, settlers primarily raised cattle and farmed grain and fruit crops. Mineral mining also played a role in the economics of the county, 
in 1858, the great silver rush began in Napa Valley, and miners flocked to the eastern hills. While gold was being prospected in other areas of the state in the 1850s, Napa County became a center for gold and quicksilver mining. In the 1860s, mining carried on but on a much larger scale with quicksilver mines operating in many areas of Napa County. From Calistoga to a few miles east of Napa, tourists of the late 19th and 20th century made the county their destination, much the same as modern day tourists. The resorts became very popular with San Franciscans anxious to escape the cold and foggy weather that often plagues the city to enjoy the warmer climate Napa County offered. In the mid-1880s, entrepreneur Samuel Brannan purchased land in the northern end of the valley at the foot of Mount St. Helena and founded Calistoga. He began developing it as a resort town, taking advantage of the area's numerous mineral hot springs. He also founded the Napa Valley Railroad Company in 1864 to bring tourists to Calistoga from San Francisco ferry boats that docked nearby. Still, the history of Napa Valley shows that those early years were difficult and expensive for the pioneers of the California wine industry. Glass bottles were pricey and hard to find. It was not uncommon for producers to reuse empty bottles, especially those that originally contained imported wine. On average, a bottle of wine cost between 20 cents to 35 cents in the early 1860s. In 1856, only 225 acres of Napa were cultivated with vines, but from that point forward, the growth was incredible. 1866 saw 3,740 acres planted. In 1875, 24,664 acres were planted. So as you can see, slowly but surely, Napa Valley was beginning to thrive as a wine region. The history of Napa Valley shows that the region really gets its start when Charles Crew Winery in Napa was founded in 1861. Other wineries quickly followed. Jacob Schramm founded Schramsburg in 1862. In fact, Schramsburg became so popular President Benjamin Harrison, the 23rd President of the United States, served it in the White House at official functions. Corresponding with the burgeoning wine industry, the first large commercial winery opened in Napa in 1872, which was called the Uncle Sam Wine Cellar. Uncle Sam wine cellars had the capacity to produce and bottle up to 2 million bottles of wine a year. By the 1880s, their business had almost doubled in size. Their location on the Napa Riverbank made shipping easy. They were soon followed by the Napa Valley Wine Company. In 1872, Hamilton Crab founded Hermosa Vineyards. Hamilton Crab was extremely successful, and by 1878, he was one of the largest vineyard owners in Napa Valley. The early success of Charles Krug and Hamilton Crab spurred other growers to cultivate vines in Napa. The town, which became Napa City, was very important. As that is where the majority of business took place. The actual city was initially developed by Nathan Coombs in 1847. 
This was two years before California was granted statehood. Following the end of the Civil War, California wine exports doubled from 100,000 cases to 225,000 cases by 1870. While California wines were exported to other countries, most notably Europe, South America, Central America, Mexico, Canada, and China. Most of the wine exported from California in those days was delivered to the East Coast of America, especially New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Baltimore. With time, wine from the Golden State became so popular that wineries from outside the state began labeling and selling their wine as California wine. Going back to the number of cultivated acres in 1875 for a moment, this is an interesting statistic because it was not until 100 years later in 1975 that Napa had the same amount of plantings. This decline took place due to phylloxera, prohibition, the Depression, and World War II, all of which took decades for the region to make a full recovery. A pivotal event in the development of the California wine industry came about thanks to the California Gold Rush and the completion of the Transcontinental Railway. Countless new settlers, merchants, farmers, and prospectors, as well as wealthy speculators, moved to the area. To give you an idea of the massive growth spurt, San Francisco grew from 1,000 residents to more than 25,000 residents in less than 12 months. People began moving in from the big city, populating many of the best wine growing regions in Napa County, Sonoma County, and other burgeoning viticulture areas. And during the formative years of Napa Valley, as you may have noted, most of the original pioneers of the area were men, but that was not always the case. In 1881, Josephine Dykeson became the first female grower, vintner, and winery owner in the Napa Valley when she and her husband, John Tyson, planted vineyards on a 147-acre parcel of land in St. Helena. The 1880s were a good period for growth in the Napa Valley. It was during this period that a lot of the varietal known as Zinfandel was being planted. So, because tariffs were low, imported wine from France and Italy was sold cheaply. At that time, and even still today, Bordeaux was seen as a wine of quality. People knew Bordeaux was produced from Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc. As I mentioned before, that was not the case with California wines, which were mostly the product of field blends and low-quality mission grapes. A portion of California wines was also fortified at the time because consumers liked sweeter tasting wines and the fortification acted as a preservative. Zinfandel and Petite Syrah were also widely planted along with a myriad of other French, Italian, and German grave varietals including Grenache, Riesling, Malbec, Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Vert, Semillon, Petit Verdot, Pinot Noir, Gamay, Muscadel, Cabernet Franc, Musket, and Cabernet Sauvignon, to name a few. With the fledgling California wine industry starting to take hold in 1880, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Eugene Helgert, the first wine research center in the New World was born. Dr. Eugene Hilbert was able to request that the California State Legislature 
fund a program for wine research at the University of California. The initial funding was for $3,000, which of course was a large sum of money in 1880. Dr. Hilbert was a noted soil scientist, and he began studying which grapes were best suited for the climate, soil, and terroir of California with his newly funded California Agricultural Experiment Station. More than half a century later, that initial program turned into the current program at the University of California, Davis, which acts and operates as one of the world's leading programs for the study of wine today. Moving on to 1890, this proved to be sort of an important decade for the young and struggling California wine industry. Records show that almost 11 million cases of California wine were produced. To help promote the sale and reputation of all those millions of cases of wine, numerous vintners entered into the wine competitions held in Paris, and several California wineries won the gold medals. So the growth of the industry was substantial during this period. To give you an idea, the areas planted with vines exploded from about 3,000 acres to more than 20,000 planted acres over just that decade. So now let's move into the 20th and 21st centuries. By the end of the 1900s, farmers had planted over 500,000 fruit and nut trees in the county, especially plums and pears. This helped to soften the blows to the agricultural economy caused by the infestation in the country's uh, county's vineyards that I mentioned before. An even greater threat to the Napa Valley wine industry arrived in 1920 with the enactment of prohibition. Vineyards and wineries were abandoned over the next 14 years with only a handful of wineries continuing to operate by producing sacramental a few growers also survived by selling their fruit as table grapes. By the time Prohibition was over, Petite Syrahs, Infantile Grenache, and Sensal were the most popular red grapes planted. Riesling and Musket of Alexandria were probably the most prevalent white wine grapes in the vineyards at that time. Due to the near death of the California wine industry, the vineyards were allowed to wither and die, as many had not been tended for years. Interestingly, even though prohibition was in full force during the decade of the Roaring Twenties, research continued on grapes, wine making, and wine production. To give you an idea about the devastation to the California wine industry during the prohibition, prior to 1990, more than 2,500 wineries were licensed to make wine in America. By 1933, less than 100 remained. Everything was starting to come together for the California wine industry until the Volstead Act was passed in 1919. And again, the Volstead Act is better known as a Prohibition, which outlawed the sale and production of alcoholic beverages. And that, again, decimated the California wine industry. It also hurt state and federal tax revenues as taxes on alcohol were very high. And they had to compensate uh, accordingly. With special permits from the Prohibition Department, some producers were allowed to make wine and brandy during Prohibition. To survive, the larger companies sold grape juice in barrels with heavy amounts of sulfur dioxide. When the barrels were opened and enough air was added to the grape juice, the fermentation process could begin, which turned the grape juice into wine. Most people just gave up, though. They abandoned their land and allowed their vines to die. The few that stubbornly remained were reduced to selling sacramental wines at best, or dry must, which is better known as raisin cakes, to home winemakers and that produced their own wine for their so-called religious purposes. The raisin cakes were sold with explicit instructions on how not to allow the product to develop 
any degree of alcohol, which of course was a not so secret code that informed consumers how to make wine. If prohibition was not bad enough, the Great Depression of 1929 added even more problems to the wine industry in California. Things did not begin to improve until the late 30s, but the rebirth was again stopped in its tracks when World War II broke out. However, the new generation of wine producers did not give up hope, and they began rebuilding the industry during the war. During the early part of the 20th century, Rudolf Boysen cultivated the first Boysen berry, and the pans made apple cider, dried grapes into raisins, drove dairy wagons, and shipped eggs to San Francisco. The electric railroad extended from Vallejo to Calistoga, and women would travel on it buying a 15 cent round trip ticket to work at the cannery in East Napa. Industry thrived with ships and the Southern Pacific Railroad sending clothes and tannery products down to San Francisco. With the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, Napa Valley's wine industry began its slow recovery. The early 1940s marked an important point in Napa Valley's history when early vintners realized they would be more successful working together than on their own. It was the beginning of many trade associations for winemakers in the area. So let's talk about one of the vintners who was very important to the development of the Napa Valley wine industry. Robert Mondavi belongs on the short list of the most important people in the development of the modern California wine industry. Robert Mondavi left his family business, which owned the previously mentioned Charles Krug Winery, to form his own winery in 1965. Robert Mondavi founded his winery in Oakville, which is now known as the Mondavi Estate. Believe it or not, this was the first new winery built in the Napa Valley since 1933. It was a massive undertaking at the time. Mondavi's efforts and pioneering ideas on the production, as well as the sales, distribution, and promotion of the California wine industry changed everything. Prior to Robert Mondavi, a few wines were sold to specific grape varietals, Although Cabernet Sauvignon was sold under that name by his family's winery, Charles Krug, since the 1940s. The concept of focusing on a few specific grapes was the brainchild of Robert Mondavi. From 1930 to 1960, the prune industry reached its zenith in Napa. However, after 1968, the legislation was passed to favor viticulture. This became more apparent during the 1990s, which was seen by many as the first golden decade for California wine. The explosion of high-end producers took hold once the 1990s came around. Several of the most famous estates today began producing wine during the incredible decade of the 90s. 1990, 1991, 1992, 93, 94. 95 and 96, as well as 97, brought about an unequaled run of great vintages and improved levels of quality to California wine. The explosion of high-end producers took hold once the 1990s came around. Several of the most famous estates today began producing wine during this incredible decade of the 90s. After the 90s and the early 2000s, Napa continued to explode as the wine capital in the United States. And that brings us to today. Napa is absolutely beautiful, and I recommend a visit if you do get the chance. Thank you so much, and have a great one. See you in the next video.